Hello, good morning everyone and thank you for making time to attend today's webinar about finding and accessing data via the UK Data Service. My name is Parisia and today I'm going to be presenting together with my colleague Heracles. Good morning from me as well. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, we hope you enjoy and that we will help you uh, learn things and help you how to access data. Thank you. Okay, so before we begin, we'll also like to thank Emma Green for facilitating today's webinar. Today's webinar, um, we are going to be covering, it's going to be in three sections. The first section will cover who we are and what we do as UK Data Service, our data sources and who can access the data in our catalogue, and the different ways we categorize the data we hold in the archive. This section will also include guidance on how to search and find data, and we'll also have a mini activity for practice and feedback. In the second section, um, we will focus on how to access data, the data we hold in the archive. We will initially look at the data access policy, which, which are the access conditions and the restrictions, and then the registration process. My colleague, Heracles, will help you get a clear understanding of the different data access levels and how to access such data. Throughout the section, we'll also be looking at the different tools which can help you find, explore, and analyze data. At the end of the presentation, we'll allow some time for questions. So please insert any questions you have in the Zoom Q&A, and we'll be answering along as well, and we'll also make time to answer the rest of the questions um, at the end of the webinar. So let's get right into the business of today. Um, let's take a look at what the UK Data Service is. So the UK Data Service holds the UK's largest collection of research data. It is home to the UK's only nationally funded research infrastructure for curating and providing access to social science data and has been influential across the world since it was first established in its original form at the University of Essex in 1967. The UK Data Service is funded by UK Research and Innovation, that's a UKRI, through the Economic and Social Research Council, which is ESRC, to meet the data needs of researchers, students, and teachers from all sectors, including academia, central and local government, charities and foundations, independent research centers, think tanks, business consultants, and the commercial sector. Our collection includes major UK government-sponsored surveys, cross-national surveys, longitudinal studies, UK census data, international aggregates, um, business data, and qualitative data. We provide more than just data. We provide guidance, resources, and trainings like this workshop we have to make the most of our data and help researchers develop their skills in data use. Here in the UK Data Archive, which is the lead organization, we work with colleagues across the UK to deliver the UK data service. We collaborate with research data experts at JISC, which is the Informa Joint Information Systems Committee, Katimash Institute for Social Research at the University of Manchester, the University of Edinburgh, and University College London. If you are interested to know more about what we do, the benefits of secondary analysis and an in-depth presentation on different types of data we hold, we will recommend that you view the recording of our last webinar, which is an introduction to the UK data service, which took place last week, the 5th of March. And this can be found on the UK data service YouTube channel as well. And a copy of the presentation slides can also be downloaded from the training and events page on our website. So um, the sources of data we hold comes from a wide range of um, places and we are allowed to disseminate them under the license from the original data depositor. While we are not involved in the collection process for the data we hold, the data are deposited with us we do take part in preserving, curating, and presenting the data in our catalog with clear details and documentation, making them available to researchers. Some of the most prominent sources for the data we hold are 
the National Statistical Authorities, which includes Office for National Statistics, ONS, National Records of Social um, Scotland and the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency. We also have data from the UK government departments, which include the Home Office, Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, which is DEFRA, the Department for Business, Innovations and Skills, and Department for Works and Pensions. We also um, have data from the intergovernmental organizations, which include the IMF, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and the World Bank. We also have data from research institutes, which include National Center for Social Research, NATSEN, the Institute for Social and Economic Research, ISA, and then the Center for Longitudinal Studies, CLS. Finally, and through our catalog, you can also find data that we have that have been deposited by individual researchers and academics. Researchers that are funded by um, ESRC also deposit their data with us through ReShare, which is the UK data services online um, repository where researchers can archive, publish, and share data. So who is the data for? So the data we hold is suitable for researchers, students, and teachers from any discipline, organization, or country who have registered an account with us. Some data sets, however, have restrictions on access due to the data redistribution license agreements we have with the data providers, but there is opportunity for everyone to access our data catalog. Although most of our users are academic users, contrary to popular beliefs, everyone, and I mean everyone can access, register and access data we hold. Users from other sectors, such as the local and national government departments, charities, think tanks, as well as commercial users are welcome to register with us. So commercial users may face further restrictions as to what they can assess and they may incur some fees depending on what they intend to use the data for. So if they want to use it for commercial purposes, they may have to pay some small amount of fee. Users who are not affiliated with any institution are also welcome to access the data to pursue their independent research. We currently have over 48,000 registered users of the service from 148 different countries. Um, the UK Data Service currently holds more than 9,000 data sets of a number of categories and types, and new data sets are added all the time. A good example of that data is related to COVID-19, which has become very popular within the UK data service in the past few years. The data we offer can be categorized in different ways, and our website has been designed to enable you to access the data you require in the most straightforward way. One of the main ways we categorize our data is by their type. So um, we have UK surveys, cross-national surveys, longitudinal, data and studies, among others. Another way we categorize our data is by purpose. So we have data for research purposes and for teaching purposes. Um, so we also have created specific data sets that can be used for teaching in a classroom setting. So our lecturers and teachers are welcome to use our data. We also categorize data by theme. And some of these themes include but they are not limited to aging, crime, economics, COVID-19, and many others. Furthermore, we also categorize data by their geography or by their access levels. Each data set held in the UK Data Service Collection has an access level designated by the data provider, depending on the detail, confidentiality, and sensitivity of the data. In the second part of this webinar, we will look further into the access levels for the data we hold. When searching for the right data to use in your research, it is important to think about the data in all these different ways. Thinking about who, what, where, and when you want to investigate can be beneficial and would help you in your search for data. 
So what types of data are available to download through the UK data service? So we hold different types of data and these include the survey micro data, international macro data, census data, and qualitative mixed metals data. Let's take a closer look at each of them. One, um, the survey micro data. These constitutes major UK surveys and large surveys, which can be used to produce national estimates and to inform policy making. Via the UK data service, you can also access collections of cross-national survey data, as well as longitudinal data and studies. We also have the international macro data, which contains socioeconomic time series data aggregated to a country or regional level. Many of the data banks are the current releases of the major statistical publications produced by intergovernmental organizations, such as the World Bank, the IMF, and the Organization for Economic and Cooperation, Economic Cooperation and Development. We also have census data, and these data include statistics from the UK censuses, which help paint a picture of the nation and how we live. They provide a detailed snapshot of the population and its characteristics and underpin funding allocation to provide public services. The UK data service holds and enables access to aggregate boundary flow and micro data from the last censuses from 1961 through to the latest 2021. Also through integrated census micro data, we provide access to census data from 1851 to 1911. We also have the qualitative data and mixed metals data. So qualitative data is the non-numeric information and mixed metals approach combine both quantitative and qualitative data. Now let's take a look at an example of a quantitative data. On this slide, we have an example of a quantitative data, and this is a screenshot from the Public Attitudes to Animal Research Survey from 2016. You can find this data set using our data catalog search tool, which we'll talk about in the next slide. This data set is available under an open data license due to its low disclosure risk. You can also see the banded ages, and we can also see that the government office regions are the lowest geographic unit in this case. This is part of the reason why this data set isn't considered high risk and is more widely available since the way it is structured minimizes the risk that participants may be identified by their responses. Let's take a look at um, a qualitative data example. What you see on this slide is a screenshot of a transcript of an interview with Frank Woolley from the data set Family Life and Work Experience before 1918. This data cycle ran from 1870 to 1973 and is also known as the Edwardians. This data set is also considered open access and you can find it through Qualibank, which is a very useful online tool we'll be looking at shortly. So just a quick reminder that if you would like to know more about the different data types we hold, I recommend that you look back at the recording of our introduction to the UK Data Service webinar, which can be found on our YouTube channel. So we're now going to guide you through the different ways in which you can browse, search and find data via the UK Data Service. So the first way of searching and finding data is by using our catalog search tool. So the catalog search box can be found by visiting our website homepage at www.ukdataservice.ac.uk. So on the home page, on the home page, you can navigate to find data. You will immediately see the catalog search box. So when you scroll down, you will see the search um, uh, data catalog. Use this search box to look for studies or series on a particular subject or the study number or the name of the principal investigators, if you know it. Once you click on search button, a list of related results will appear on the data catalog. So, so you can select to view your results 
in studies or in series. You can also use various filters on the left side of the data catalog pages in order to narrow down your search. So the available filters include the date from and then the date to. You can, you can also search using the topic areas. Please note that this filter only contains a limited set of high level topics. You can also search here using, you can also filter by the data type, which are the longitudinal studies, UK data, um, UK survey data, business micro data, and census data. And you can also use the access filter to filter by um, the different access levels we have, which my colleague will talk about in the next section. You can also refine your search by country. So you can search for a number, uh, different countries um, if you're looking for a specific data relating to a specific country. Finally, you can also reset, reset your, um, your search to start all over again. Another way of finding data via the UK data service is by visiting our browse data page. So this option is very useful if you have a particular research topic that you're interested in, or you know the specific type of data you're looking for. So the browse data page can be accessed um, when you go to our homepage, which is the ukdataservice.ac.uk. When you click on find data, you can scroll down and then you come to browse and access data as pointed here. As you can see, once you visit this page, you'll be able to browse data sets based on major categories, which we've discussed early on, on uh, in this webinar. Here, you can browse data by theme. You can browse data by the data type. Another option we have on this page is also to browse by general. So the search terms, here you can also browse for data through um, the following four different ways, through the search term, which is another option that will direct you to another direct link to the assets, which I'll talk about shortly. You can also click on geography and clicking on this will help you find specific geographic data, such as administrative, electoral or boundary data. You can also use our online analysis tool, um, which will help you explore the data held in our collection. And you can also use the open data, which is data that, um, but my colleague will talk about the access level for this particular data. Okay, so now let's go to, let's let's do an example. So as an example, we can now have a further look on browsing data by theme. The theme section will be particularly helpful if you know the topic you want to research, but are not sure where to start with finding useful data sets. So this slide shows some of the popular themes that we have. Um, which are by aging, COVID-19, crime, among others. Um, selecting any of the above themes will present as the individual theme page. So in this case, we are using the COVID-19 as an example. So the individual theme pages not only list key data sets on a selected topic, but they also allow users to view all the data related to this topic within the data catalog by clicking the View All Data button. In this example, in this example, the yellow arrow points are the view all data button for the COVID-19 data theme. You can also navigate and select the view button next to the key data sets of your selected theme, which will take you to the individual study page. So if you click on view, it will take you to the individual study page. In our example, you can see that if you click the view button, for the first key data set listed in this session, which is the Business Insights and Conditions Survey, this will take you directly to its catalog page. There you can find the full details for this specific data set. All, this, all its relevant documentation, such as data dictionary, variable list, and user guides, and a lot of further um, resources will be available there. In the second part of this webinar, we'll provide you with further information on what can be found in a study specific catalog page. So another way to browse, search and find data via the UK data service is by using the humanities and social science electronic thesaurus tool, which is the HACET. Your search query is treated both as a free text search 
it will match occurrences of that search string in a metadata field in a catalog record and as a keyword search, which will match keywords found in the corresponding keyword metadata field in the catalog records. Keywords are subject terms drawn from the UK data archives asset, which have been used to index each study at concept or variable level and which represents the concepts covered by that data. So keyword matches are shown in search results prefixed by keyword. If you know the name of the keyword you are looking for, you can type it into the search box directly by typing keyword followed by the keyword in question in capital letters. For example, keyword poverty, as you can see on the suggested options on the slide. Another interesting option here is that you can perform a search the other way around. As we already mentioned, UK, um, as we already mentioned, studies in the UK data service collection are all assigned keywords which are aligned with the asset. You can directly access this working tool by selecting the help button along the top, along the top toolbar on our website, and then scrolling down to the section searching for data. When you get to the searching for data, you when you click on that, it will open this page where you can you can select using Hasset to search for tools for data. So Hasset has over four thousand six hundred terms and more than three thousand five hundred alternative terms, and it is a great tool that can help you find those appropriate terms to search for in the data catalog. You can browse a full Hasset from A to Z or click the hierarchy tab to explore by subject. In our example, we have selected we have selected the term poverty. And as you can see on your screen, the two presented us with the broader concept, social disadvantage, as well as narrower and further related terms that could potentially be worth exploring. Finally, these two will allow us to perform a direct search for our selected keyword in the UK data service catalog. Before we return to Mentimeter and to an activity we have prepared for you so that you can practice finding data, I'd also like to present to you a set of useful tools which are designed to support your search and explore the data held in our catalog. A very useful tool to explore survey data is the variable and question bank, which allows you to find and retrieve information about variables and questions from a range of survey data sets held by the UK data service. You can use this tool to identify which survey data sets contain questions or variables of interest to you. You can directly access the variable and question bag the same way you used to um, access the asset tool. So you go to our website um, and then you scroll down to searching for data and then you click on variable and question bank. A key, benefit, a key benefit of the variable and question bank is that users can find consistency across data sets. For example, where harmonized or common variables have been used over time across different economic and social surveys, each variable record provides a link to more information about the term. The UK data service variable and question bank contains over 450,000 variables with over 250,000 containing question, text, or responses. So you can enter your search terms in the search box, click go. You can also combine search terms with the filters which are present on the left-hand side. So you can, you can filter it out by series, the survey country data, among others. In this example, we have searched for our highest educational qualification in this tool, which, as we can see, returned thousands of results. From the results, and in order to view a single variable record on one page, we can click on the variable name, which is marked in red in the results um, page. To compare variables, we can choose add to my variables next to the results we are interested in. And then we can select the My Variable Basket at the top right of the page. Variables can be compared side by side as shown on our example. So we can compare one variable 
with the other. A key limitation of this tool is that not all studies in our catalog have had their variables added to the search. However, you can check whether the survey you are interested in is covered by using the survey filter. So looking at the next tool is the Polybank. As per its name, this tool is the UK Data Services Search and Browse Interface for Qualitative Data Objects, allowing you to search the content of text files, such as interviews, essays, open-ended questions, and reports. Similar to the previous tools we have already covered, you can directly access Colibank by selecting the help button along the top two bar on our website, scrolling down to the section searching for data and then searching Colibank. In our example, we have searched for poverty and we can see that our search returns results where poverty was mentioned as part of the interview transcripts, interview summaries, reports, essays, as well as a web resource. Each result provides a direct link to the catalog page of the qualitative data set that this information relates to. The purple arrow on this slide is pointing on this link. So like with other results or other search functions in our website, Colibank results can also be filtered further in order to narrow our search. Some of the available options are the resource type, as we can see on our screen, date and collection title. Excellent. So uh, what we will cover on the next part is we have seen some information on how to find the data. Uh, now we will move uh, on the information on how to access the data. We will go through the three tier access policy and we will see examples on open data, safeguarded data and controlled data. Each data set we, we hold in the UK Data Service Collection has a designated access level and users are required to agree to the terms and conditions which relate to how a specific data set can be used. Different access levels may be assigned to different data sets because of the sensitivity of the data or to ensure the anonymity and integrity of the data. In the UK Data Service, we provide access to data via the three-tier access policy. This is open data, safeguarded data and control data, often referred to as secure data. It's important to note that the UK data service provides the different levels of access as agreed with the data owners. We do not own any of the data we provide. The data are deposited through us and we are allowed to disseminate them for secondary research. A very important question to respond to is how to identify the access level. Let's say we have found the data sets and we are looking now to find what is the access level that my data set uh, is assigned. So on my screen here, we can see an example. We have uh, one of our most popular uh, uh, data sets, the Understanding Society. This is the main uh, data set with study number 6614. And how to identify the access level every data set has its own catalog page. So this is the catalog page for this specific data set. Under the details tab, we see the study number. Furthermore down, I haven't included it on the screenshot. We can see a summary. We can see some important information. And the access level is here. These data are safeguarded. So we know in which access level uh, we belong. Of course, clicking on the access data button, we will be able to see the specific access conditions. So here uh, we notify everyone that this data collection is available to UK data service registered users subject to the end user license agreement. And commercial use of the data requires approval from the data owner and we will inform you on that. We will see exactly how we can access it. On our next screen here, we can see a table on the left hand side, we can see the access level. So as we say, we have open data, safeguarded data and control data. We will go through each one of those. What I would like to note here is that, for example, on each access level, so we can have safeguarded data with different access condition. Some safeguards are lighter than the others uh, with the most uh, with the highest safeguard in the safeguarded section being the special license. I will guide you through each one of those. So 
three access levels, but in each access level, especially under the safeguarded data, we can have different access conditions. Let's start with the first access level, the open data. Governments around the world are increasingly committed to data transparency and to the principle that data which are publicly funded should be publicly available. As we progress, more and more of our data collections are available using open data licenses, and we work closely with the data owners to identify and remove any unnecessary barriers to access. Many of the UK census data we hold are available via this way as open data. Data licensed for use with an open license are data which are not personal and have relatively few restrictions to use. By preference, the open government license is used where data collections are crown copyright and the Creative Commons attribution license where the data are collections, uh, the data collections, excuse me, are copyright others. It's important to note that to access open data, no registration or authentication is required. The data can be automatically downloaded or viewed in our online tools. Let's see some examples. As the first example, we have a very another popular set of data, 2021 census aggregated data. So as you see on my screen, uh, we can see here that uh, immediately, of course, on the details tab, it says this data set is open and we have selected the access data and we see that data may be accessed directly via, this is a tool we use for aggregate data. And these data are freely available to all and licensed under the terms of an open government license. Uh, you see, I'm not logged in. So clicking directly the Statistics UKDS tool, we will move to the tool uh, page here. So this is a tool where you can uh, access, uh, find statistics about the UK population uh, from uh, aggregate data on the censuses. Another option here we have, uh, for example, another data set, which is open access data set, the Oxford Internet Survey 2013. And we see, uh, again, we are speaking about open data. The data collection is to be made available to any user without the requirement of registration. And of course, here it doesn't send us to an online tool. It gives us the file format that this data is available. And of course, we can select the download button and the download will begin uh, for us. So we have covered so far the open data, which doesn't need any registration or authentication uh, in order to be accessed. Turning next, safeguarded data. Uh, this is our largest, we can say, uh, category of data. Uh, thousands more data sets under the access level safeguarded data can be downloaded order and analyzed online as well, some of them, by registering and accepted our end user license agreement. Some safeguarded data sets, as we have said, may have additional conditions and additional steps that we might need to do. Uh, it's important to note that the safeguarded is the uh, currently the Office for National Statistics preferred term for the data we provide under our end user license agreement. Data licensed for use in the safeguarded category are not personal data, but the data owners consider there to be a risk of the higher risk of disclosure resulting from linkage to other data, such as uh, private databases. Uh, as we can see on the table, the main condition for accessing any different types who have safeguarded data and different access conditions, but who can access? So the main condition to access any data under this category is to first be registered. Most of the safeguarded data sets are available under the end user license as soon as you are a registered user. Some you need to be registered and accept that. Be registered and do an application. But the common is that you need to register and accept the end user license agreement. So since we say that we need to do that, let's see how actually to register. Uh, two different uh, ways to register. So if you are a UK academic user, um, your, uh, your organization uh, will have uh, automatically be uh, on the list of accepted uh, organizations. And by searching the name of your organization, 
you will be able uh, to find your university and log in with the credentials that have been already issued to you by your university. So as an example, we have, let's say, suppose we have a university of uh, Manchester, a user. So you don't, you just select login on the top right. We do not have a, a register button. Everything is done using the login button. So we go login, university, I say, I'm in the university of Manchester. So technically you search if your organization is included on the list. If it is, you will click continue. It will send you to your organizational uh, confirmation for your identity. You will use the credentials you have already been issued by your university. Once you do that, the system uh, will uh, direct you back to our website to complete the registration form because this is the first time you are accessing our services. At the end of the registration form, you will uh, confirm your details. You will be able to see the end user license agreement to read it and then to click register. This is when your registration is ready. It's part of the registration to accept the end user license agreement. What about not UK academic users that cannot use credentials they have from their organization? So uh, you will, if your organization is not included, and this will not be included if it's not a UK college or university in most of the times. All you need to do in order to register is to tick the box, my organization is not listed. And then uh, you need to request a username. So we will provide you, the UK Data Archive will provide you with credentials in order to be able to use the website. Let's have a quick look on how this will work you need to reconfirm that my organization is not listed. I actually need to request a UK data service username. You type your email address. Here we need your institutional email address. So let's say you are in a university in Italy or in Spain, anywhere in the world. Your institutional, your organizational email address, unless you do research for personal purposes, for genealogical purposes, in that case, you can use a, a Gmail, a Hotmail, any email. You will select to receive a code. You will receive a code on your email. You will submit this and you will fill the application to request a username. We will screen the application. We will contact you through our credentials uh, email address and you will have a link in order to actually complete your registration. When you click your link, you see because the username and password are coming from us. You will see this page, the UK Data Archive Identity Provider. You will insert the username we provided with you, uh, your, the password you created, and then you will be uh, completing the step we saw earlier, the registration form, where you, at the end, you will be able to accept the end user license agreement. Uh, on our help pages, of course, we have uh, specific guidance on uh, both and or registration process and of course do let us know uh, if you have any questions on that so assuming uh, ah, i didn't mention i'm really sorry that the uh, for people who are not in a uk college or university and we have provided the credentials next time you want to log in you can either select that my organization is uk data archive that can be sometimes confusing the easiest way is to say that if you can't find your organization, uh, sign in here and you will click that and you will be sent to this page. So every time you just need to do that step to use the username and password, we provide it to you. Excellent. So uh, we have seen so far safeguarded data and we have seen that to access any type of safeguarded data, we need to be a registered user. So we have seen how to register and accept the end user license agreement, which applies to all safeguarded data sets. Let's now see each category, some examples. Let's start with the end user license. So once you are logged into your account, so here you see I am a registered user. Now I have logged in and I want to access uh, this uh, example data set, which on the details I have seen that it is a safeguarded data set. And on the access uh, conditions, I see that is available to register users. I am, and I have already accepted the end user license agreement. So all I need to do is to click add to my account. 
here I need to assign the data set into uh, a project. So this is part of the safeguards uh, because you need to inform the service and this information may be passed to the data owners of why I want to use the data set. So I'm using it for this purpose. So we need to create a project to assign it into. Um, let's see as well how we can create a new project. Of course, if you already have a project, you can select add to existing project. We select create a new project. Uh, when creating a new project, we need to enter the title of our project, uh, the abstract, using as much detail as possible to describe the intended use of the data. Uh, we have three different ways to classify the way you use the data. Non-commercial projects are for research projects and students, dissertations, PhDs. Uh, commercial projects are the projects where the main purpose is to generate income and there is no public good. And of course, we have teaching projects uh, for use within a classroom setting. We enter the information. Now, for the purpose of, the of this webinar, we are creating a non-commercial uh, project. We have created our project, so I have named it example project title, and I assigned the data set into my project. So, as we expected, the status of the data set is green and active. That means that I have met all the conditions. It was only one to be a registered user who has accepted the agreement. What I can do to download, all I need to select actions and we will see the formats. The majority of the data sets in our collection are available in the three standard formats, data, SPSS and uh, tab delimited. Uh, you select which ones you want download selected and your download will begin. Some important information before we process, uh, we proceed to the next uh, type of safeguarded data we might come across is that if you see that the data set you have found, uh, usually it will have a six digit number instead of four and it will be starting with eight five. This is why on this slide I have eight five plus four. Uh, this uh, will show you that it's deposited, so we have the main, the curated, let's uh, say, repository in the UK data service where you will find the national, the big surveys, the national surveys and uh, data sets from uh, the research uh, institutions. Uh, and also, uh, as Parousia said on the first part, we have the research repository, which is a repository where uh, it was initially created for ESRC uh, grant holders to be able to submit their data and share their data. Of course, uh, now anybody can share data through that. Data sets in the research repository, it's the online uh, self-deposit, let's say, repository. Of course, the UK data service checks the deposits that are made through and are in touch with the depositor. And the depositor decides if the data will be open or safeguarded. So in such a case, you will see that the process is slightly different. The system will guide you to download from the research repository. Clicking it, you will go to the research repository. You will log in with your uh, credentials, depending on the way you log in, and you will be guided. So it's, it will be either open or safeguarded. Some of them might need uh, to send an email, for example, to the deposit to the depositor, to the person who deposited the data, to explain uh, ethics. Uh, depends, but. Uh, I safeguard it, you will have to be logged in, open, you will be able to download it immediately. That was one case that we wanted to uh, make sure it's uh, to guide you via because it's slightly different. Now, back to where we are, we have seen how to download safeguarded data who were only needed registration. Now, let's see the next case we might encounter safeguarded data that I need to be registered, but I also need to accept some special conditions. Let's see an example on that. An example data set, the British Social Attitude Survey 2021. Uh, we see, of course, safeguarded data set, and we see on the access conditions, the usual one, I need to be registered, and different information. Commercial use of the data requires approval from the data owner. And an additional condition, 
everybody needs to acknowledge, to read and acknowledge that they understand this paragraph, that commercial organizations must notify the National Center for Social Research, etc. So you see, I'm not logged in yet, so I'm not, I haven't logged in in my account, so I'm not a registered user as the system at the moment can recognize, but this is grayed out to add it in my account, but I have a button here to access online through another tool. We have the Nestar tool. So somebody will say, how can I access it? Because I need to be a registered user. If I just click select access online, we will see some information. So we will be able just to see documentation, uh, to read about the variables, uh, to read variable information and some guidance, but we will not be able to actually see any data. Via the same tool, if we are logged in, we will be able also to do some analysis. We can create some tables and complete some analysis. So that's another way instead of downloading the data and using a program uh, to see if the data set can be useful for your research needs. Back on here, uh, I will log in and I will add the data set in my account in a non-commercial project. So this um, note here will not apply to me. I will be registered user and I will add the data set in a non-commercial project. So I will just need to acknowledge the additional condition. This is my non-commercial project. I have added it and you see now it's not green. It has a yellow request access. So why it has the yellow request access? Because I'm missing a step. I need to agree that I understood the additional condition of use. All I need to do is to complete actions. This is the workflow that will open. I have done, I have accepted the end user license through my registration and I need to tick if I'm happy, of course, that I have read and accept the above statement. Once I do it, my dataset is active, actions, download, and similarly, I can download it. With this, we covered uh, this case. So let's move on to another case, safeguard the data set that needs the permission from the depositor before I can be given access. What we will do in that case, we will use the same data set we just saw, but instead of adding it in a non-commercial project, I will add it in a commercial project, which means that the, uh, I need approval from the data owner for this case. So if I create a commercial project and I assign the data set to my commercial project, my workflow will look like this. So you see, this is different. Uh, I have, I'm a registered user. I have accepted the end user license. I can accept, I can tick the box for the additional condition of use, but I have further steps because my project is a commercial project and this is the only time at our service that a payment uh, is required, uh, but it's the least, uh, uh, the commercial project are the least popular. Let's say we have not have a lot of commercial projects. A payment required, yes, and we will need to, we will create for you a commercial license and you need to make an application for the depositor, clicking the form. And this is just a screenshot of the uh, how the application looks like. So the applicant needs to submit to us this application to explain that this is my project, this is the people who I want to have access to the data, that's the data, why I'm requiring the data, the justification, and of course, the proposal is the most important. We need to explain to the data owner that individual X wants to use this data set for this reason to create this type of output for commercial purposes. The data owner will review the application and we will be completing alongside you. So once we have depositor approval, we will make this tick here and you work. On, you have to accept the additional conditions and we work together on the next steps. Once all steps are green, you will have the permission. Of course, we will be in contact with you to inform you and you will be able to download it only, of course, for the purposes you have explained uh, that you will use it for. A depositor permission can be, of course, uh, asked uh, in non-commercial, so we have the commercial way, but we can it can be asked for other reasons. So here we have an example, the Health Survey for England 2018. 
safeguard the data set. The data set is available to register users. Okay, and we have some limitations. So it says access is limited to applicant based in those specific countries. Access is limited to applicants based in higher education institution, central and local government, NHS. So it gives us some limitations. And with a note that any access request from users not in the above categories will be subject to approval by the depositor. So that means that uh, if I am a user uh, in my account, or if my account or my settings, I'm a user outside of these countries, when I add the data set, into my non-commercial project, it's of course clear that this data set cannot be used for commercial reasons because it has to be not for profit education and research purposes only. Uh, if, I, if I add it in my non-commercial project and the system identifies that I am in a country outside of the permitted countries or I am, a, let's say, a commercial user, but I'm doing a non-commercial project, uh, which has been assigned to me by the government department. Uh, the system will identify that and it will ask me to do the same steps we saw earlier, the uh, application to ask permission from the depositor. I will not be able to download the data immediately. Again, same steps. Once all approvals are in place, we will be able to release the data to you. With this, I believe we have covered the depositor permission case and let's see... Um, a more, not wide, but a special case, let's say, safeguarded data sets which are subject to special license. Uh, if the safeguarded data set you would like to access is a special license data set, so you see it's safeguarded, but it's special license, this will be written on its title clearly. Um, so uh, the special license data are anonymized, are still anonymized data, but they contain more detailed information than their uh, less restrictive counterparts. For example, some special license data sets contain lower level geographies. So remember at the beginning of our uh, session uh, together on the second half of it, we saw the 6614, which was the main version of the understanding society. Now we see we have the same but we have as well a special license access. So this one includes some further details. It goes deeper on the month a participant was born, or it can go uh, deeper in uh, where they live. It can give us uh, lower super, out, uh, super output areas. So it's the same, but it includes some further, more restricted information. For that, I will show you on the next slides. It's very important to read the documentation and the details to make sure that it is exactly what you need. Uh, so we have the special license uh, data set and we want to access it. Let's say we are sure that this is what we need. We have identified that this is what we need. The data collection is available to end user license. Perfect, I'm a registered user. Of course, important to know that commercial use is not permitted for special license data and no teaching for special license data. It's uh, These data have higher risk uh, and they are still anonymized, but there is higher risk which uh, can uh, arrive from linking the data set uh, with uh, other databases. So the restrictions, the safeguards are a bit uh, higher on those. And we see that any use of course, non-commercial use will need to be approved by the data owner through a special license application. Again, I will log in, I will add it to my non-commercial, of course, project, and this will be my workflow where I am the registered user and I need to now complete this step, which is to do the special license application. I click the bundle, I will show you, and once all is completed, I send it to the email I see on my workflow. This is how the bundle looks like. So the project lead needs to complete the special license project application with information about the project, why the data is, are needed uh, for the data owner to understand that indeed this person needs the data. For every additional member, so for every member who will need to access the data, we require an additional researcher form and the project lead and every member will need uh, separately each person to complete the special license user agreement. The project lead collects all the documents from the members 
and get in, in touch with us. And we start the process. We will screen the form. We will check if anything is missing. We will send it to the data owner. And we will be completing once everything is done. We will be completing this alongside you through the process. Here I have included some very important information. Uh, users interested in accessing special license data are advised are, uh, to read the information in the document Research Data Handling and Security Guide for Users. Uh, this has uh, guidance on storing and accessing data because the special license data, because of the higher risk uh, that they carry with them, uh, they have a more tight uh, storage and access requirements. So they can only be accessed in an institutional setting, for example. It cannot be accessed privately at the home or be downloaded or stored in a personal device. It, it has to be institutional access. Of course, the guide has all the information uh, we need. And a lot of times... Uh, for uh, student dissertation. So we will suggest from masters, from PhDs and above usually uh, to request such data because a lot of times uh, master students or in lower uh, undergraduate degrees, they cannot meet the storage requirements that the data owner uh, needs because they do not have uh, an office. They can, there is no way to, to store and access it institutionally. Very important, of course, when applying for social survey data, we strongly recommend to always check the less restrictive version of the data because the data will not be authorized for use to you unless the justification is clear and the data owner can understand that, yes, indeed, for this project, the person needs this information, which is only in the special license version of it. For that purpose, the left part is part of the details uh, if we click on details and we scroll down, we will see this part and the documentation. So for every data set, you can see details and documentation. We read here that for understanding society, there are two versions of the main. One is available under the end user license, so just for registered user, and the other one under the special license. The special license contains month and year of birth value, so you see more details. And also, you have... Uh, on the dictionaries, you have all the variables that are included. And a lot of times the data owners have also submitted. Here we have like a PDF which explains which variables are in the special license, which are not in the less restrictive version. So you read it and you make your application uh, to explain why you need that more restricted version of the data set. A common question, uh, can I access special license data? We said it's the institutional access. Uh, can I access it from home? Of course, the data are never allowed to be downloaded in a personal device. Uh, there is a way this started during COVID-19. Uh, it needs uh, the completion of a, a specific form. So first, in order to know if my, the special license data are allowed for access from home, we need to check the list of the data which are included in the permitted list. And if it is, we need to complete the appendix on the special license user agreement we saw earlier on the band in order to agree to some extra 12 additional conditions. Only once we have done those steps and the service has provided the okay, then we can access from home and the access is never done by downloading the data. The access, the access is done through using an institutional device, an institutional laptop at home in order to remote into the uh, institutional device which has uh, the data or the place which is stored always using the institutional VPN. Of course, all the specifics and the details are here and I have included uh, the link. You will have access to the slides after the webinar. Uh, moving next, uh, control data. Uh, control data through Secure Lab. So let's uh, have a look what is the control data. Uh, we provide access to data that are too confidential or sensitive to be released via download. So the control, the secure data cannot be downloaded. This is a very valuable resource for researchers because these data are often accessed for their details geographies uh, of the respondent's location, including postcodes and grid references. 
These data are not suitable, of course, for use by inexperienced researchers such as undergraduates and should only be used if absolutely necessary. If data available at a lower level license can be used, researchers are strongly encouraged to apply for the alternative versions. Typically, these control data sets come from the Office for National Statistics and other large data providers, such as the Center for Longitudinal Studies, the Institute for Social and Economic Research, which is based next to us here at the University of Essex. And those control data are only accessed via our Secure Lab. What is Secure Lab? It's an online environment. It's a remote access safe environment that enables the researcher to access, undertake analysis without the need to download the data. So the researcher is being provided with credentials for this environment. We run technical checks. Uh, I will show you the steps we do. And the researcher is logging in on this environment. No other online um, system is running. And through this online environment, they do the analysis, we provide the software in the environment, and then once the analysis is done, the researcher is raising an output request that I have created this output in this folder, and this is being checked then for statistical disclosure before this can be released to the researcher. Uh, yes, let me progress this. It's important to note that the, uh, the user must be based in the UK to be able to access the data. Um, there is, um, a, a, we call it the International Data Access Network. So through the International Data Access Network, uh, we are trying to provide access to UK control data from some specific safe rooms in some specific European countries. At the moment, there is a safe room in IAB in Germany, and I think one in France, which is uh, active at the moment, where somebody can make an application to go there to access control data, but a limited amount of data sets are available. But please keep an eye if you are a researcher from abroad and you will need to access uh, control data that are in the UK. Uh, the rule of thumb is we need, in order to access Secure Lab, we need to be based in the UK and have a UK affiliation. Uh, some requirements, uh, there are slightly different applications. So uh, control data, you might see that we the application differs if it is data provided by the ONS, if the data are provided by anybody else except the ONS, or by the Smart uh, Energy Research Lab. The reason is here that the application is different and it's determined by the data you would like to access and the actual legal gateway to access this data. ONS data, uh, we need to comply with the Digital Economy Act. Uh, then for non-ONS, we need to comply with the UK GDPR and the Smart Energy Code for Smart Energy Lab. So it is different the application procedure is slightly different, it's not much different. Important to note, we have said that we need to be based in the UK and have a UK affiliation. We need to have completed safe researcher training. Uh, this can be done uh, through us. We offer uh, this uh, training, or if you have already done it with another provider, we will confirm that and we will proceed. Uh, for we need to become an accredited researcher via the ONS if we are applying for ONS data. Of course, if I'm making an application for ONS data and non-ONS data at the same project, I need to follow both the application procedures. And yes, and we said that uh, the data are not generally available to students. We need to be experienced. We need to prove that we are competent with using uh, confidential microdata. And finally, your organization will also need to accept legal responsibility for you. There is a form for everything. To simplify it, on our uh, browse pages, you will see that, okay, I want to apply for non-ONS data, for ONS data, Smart Energy Lab, or this is the outside of the UK. You will tell me, how do I know which one to follow? The simple answer is uh, the workflow. So your workflow will tell you exactly what you need to do. You will add the data set. You will access, you will go to the uh, web page. You will find the data set. You will read the documentation and the details to make first sure that, yes, indeed, for my project, I need 
to access the secure version of this data set. And then you will create your non-commercial project. You will assign the data set to your non-commercial project as we have already seen. And you will see the actions on your workflow that you need to do. So this is an example from the secure version of the Understanding Society, so a non-ONS version. So it tells us that the project lead needs to complete the research proposal. Every team member needs to complete an accredited researcher application. Every person needs to complete the secure access user agreement, which will be countersigned by a, an official at their organization. And then the training, of course, we will check your training and we will mark this as done. We will send the application for approval. Once we have it, we will tick this for you. A secure lab account, our technical team will contact you directly to set up everything uh, for you. Uh, the setup, of course, for the secure lab is institutionally. Uh, so it is accessed at your institution. The IP used needs to be to belong uh, to the organizations. Then uh, there are a lot of technical requirements. I will not go in detail on that. Uh, the right uh, screenshot is Similar, but for a non-ONS, an ONS, excuse me, so a data set uh, provided by the ONS business structure database. You see it's similar, so the training is similar, the setup is similar, but the forms are different. So we need the DA research project application, and instead of completing a form to say, to demonstrate our competency with using uh, confidential microdata, here we need for ONS data to have obtained accredited researcher status. Of course, once we click, it gives us the guidance to do. Uh, the process is usually, of course, there are quick and non-quick ones. They uh, depends on the complexity and how many uh, data owners, but we can say that an average is around two to three months uh, at the moment uh, from the application uh, receival to uh, getting access via Secure Lab. And the same question as we did earlier, can I access a Cure Lab from home? So after everything has been done and your institutional access is okay and you can go to your institution and you can access the Secure Lab, then again, we need to check if the data sets are in the permitted lists. If they are in the permitted list, there is an additional application process depending on what data we have. So we just don't go and do it. We make an application for home access. Uh, on the on our home pages, it has all the application process, uh, the agreement before we can be authorized to access Secure Lab from home. Of course, uh, recently our technical team has uh, done some excellent changes and the access to Secure Lab, uh, now the technical requirements are easier uh, of course, making sure that the safety and the protection of the data are, are the first priority, but uh, we are trying to remove barriers as much as possible to so researchers can access Secure Lab from their institution and, if possible, from home as well. Uh, thank you. So, uh, we are reaching the end of our webinar. It's uh, 12.26. We will have some minutes for questions. Just uh, before we go on that, to give you some information uh, on our help pages, you can find uh, everything. Information about the registration, information about Secure Lab, uh, COVID-19. We are planning, of course, now we're moving away from COVID-19, thankfully. Uh, so, we might change that soon to home working procedures. Uh, different types of data, what uh, my colleague Parousia covered. And of course, uh, how to explore data online here. You can find more tools uh, on how to explore data uh, online without the need to download them. Uh, how to contact us? Uh, anything you need, uh, we have our web form. Uh, you select the type of your query and this goes directly to the correct team uh, to support you. And of course, uh, if that is not an option, you can send us an email directly, but we uh, strongly suggest the use of the form because this is the way to ensure that you will receive a response and the email will not be uh, overlooked. Uh, so we have the form and feedback. As we said, any feedback you would like to provide us, again, on our uh, page, you will find the feedback button. 
in order to provide us with any suggestions. Uh, we are here to support you and the research uh, to get access to secondary social science data. That's the importance to do the, the work correctly so we can all benefit from it. So please get in touch uh, to let us know what we can do better and uh, what we can improve. Uh, thank you very much. You can see as well, again, a link. You will have access to the slides. Uh, on Twitter, on YouTube. YouTube, you can find all current and past webinars as well and a lot of information, our direct email. And yes, any questions, I will uh, open our chat uh, on our Q&A. Uh, thank you. So uh, thank you for staying with us. Uh, send us any questions you have on our help desk. Please call us, feel free. Uh, we are happy to work together with you. Uh, for the common goal of promoting uh, the research. Thank you, uh, and I Thank wish you a very everyone. good day. Thank you, everyone, for joining, and we hope to receive more queries on our help desk. If you need any guidance, please feel free to message us. Have a good day, everybody.